This is the eternal flame of Paris that was extinguished in the summer of 1998 when the drunken Mexican tourist came stumbling in onto the Arc de Triomphe in order to go to the tomb of the unknown soldier because he was pissed off that his fellow Latin American country lost the World Cup Finals. So he decided to piss on the eternal flame of the tomb of the unknown soldier that was installed here in 1920 in order to pay tribute to all the soldiers that lost their lives in the Great War. Well, he managed to extinguish that flame and was subsequently arrested, deported from this country, never allowed to come back again. The Mexican Ministry of Foreign Relations had to apologize to the country of France for this terrible disrespect. But where does this tradition come from? Well, we have to go back all the way to ancient Roman times when there was a cult of women known as the Vestal Virgins. These women had to keep a flame lit in the middle of Rome in order to keep the empire thriving. If the flame went out, that spelled danger for the empire. Well, the flame went out in the fourth century and that was the fall of the Roman Empire. And now no one is getting close to the eternal flame whatsoever. The tradition of keeping an eternal flame still exists in many countries all around the Western world, including my native US, also in Canada and many other places. Stay hydrated, my friends. This is where the crown of thorns of Jesus Christ were displayed here at Saint Chapelle, which was built in 1248 by Louis the Ninth, who apparently bought that crown of thorns from a emperor in Constantinople for 135,000 pounds. To build this huge, beautiful, light-filled chapel only took 40,000 pounds. So the relic was way more expensive. And we can see the light streaming in. All the stained glass windows here depict the entire history of Christendom from Genesis all the way to the passion of Christ, all the way to the spread of the relics to the end of days right here at the Rose Window. So if you want to learn the history of Christendom, all you gotta do is read this gigantic graphic novel in physical form. And down below we see the royal symbols, the Fleur de Lis. Now this church was secularized back in the French Revolution, so it's no longer part of the Catholic Church, nor there's any services. So the Crown of Thorns was displayed until the devastating fire in Notre Dame. Relics end, end up getting a lot weirder from every single body part of every single saint to anything that they wore or used. So Crown of Thorns probably was one of the more famous ones. This is the glass pyramid of the Louvre Museum here, built by I.M. Pei in 1988. He's a Chinese-American architect who I really enjoy but I have a complicated relationship with this glass pyramid because while I think it's beautiful on its own and it's apparently built in the same proportions as the Great Pyramids of Giza which is awesome I think it sticks out as an eyesore compared to the classical beautiful architecture of the Louvre itself I mean just look at all of that classical beauty and then you have steel and glass right over here there was a conspiracy theory saying that there was 666 glass panes here. But that was proven to be incorrect because there's actually 673. And a lot of people tried to count it and they've come up around the same number. So there is no grand conspiracy with this being the Illuminati. So let me know what you think. Is it beautiful or is it an eyesore? This is the famous painting stolen by Napoleon from Italy that was cut in half in order to put it here in the Louvre Museum. This was known as one of the most beautiful paintings in the world, the wedding feast at Cana, depicting Jesus Christ turning water into wine at a wedding ceremony. But then this other painting got really famous, the Mona Lisa, so that's taking all the spotlight. So why was it cut in half? Well, Napoleon invaded Italy, and one of their missions was to save the artwork. Apparently the artwork was in dire circumstances when this was displayed at the monastery of San Giorgio. So they decided to take it and bring it to safety over here. What did they do to save the painting? Well, they tore it out of the walls from the monastery. Apparently the nails came out and a lot of paint scattered all throughout the floor. And then they found out that they can't actually transport this huge painting intact. So they had to tear it in half in order to reassemble it here in the Louvre. And we can actually see the markings of where it was torn in half. Yep, 
Uh, they destroyed a the painting in order to uh, quote unquote save a painting. Nonetheless, it's a beautiful artwork and it's here in the Louvre. And it's one out of more than 200 paintings that were stolen, plundered from Italy, still here in the Louvre. However, that actually compelled the Italian national to come all the way over here to steal the Mona Lisa and bring it back to Italy. Because he actually thought that was one of Napoleon's plunders. He was actually wrong. His name was Vincenzo Perugia, and the painting was retrieved two years later. He ended up getting a sentence of only one year. So, what do you think? Should the other two, more than 200 paintings from Italy be brought back to Italy, or should they stay here at the Louvre? right in front of the Mona Lisa. In this random Parisian building, there's a cannonball lodged inside, but where does it come from? Well, I'm joined by tour guide Corey Fry, who knows the real history of this cannonball. We tend to hear about the, the French Revolution, but there are actually a lot of smaller ones as well. And here in the Marais district, there was a, a quick little revolution in 1830 where they built barricades to remove their king from power. And all these small cannonballs were flying through the area. One of them, by mistake, lodged itself up in the facade of a building called the Hotel de Sens from the 16th century. And it's one of the amazing treasures that turns Paris into a city of discovery. And I love keeping an eye out for these beautiful objects and you never know when you'll find them. So keep an eye out for cannonballs, bullet holes, and all types of holes here in Paris. This is a French fry in Paris, check them out. Really, really great tours. This is the church in Paris where you can get a really close up look into gargoyles. Usually they're very high up, but here at the Church of St. Severin, you can get a really close up look. But what are gargoyles and why are they called that? Well, the term gargoyle comes from gargling. So they actually spout water. The reason this was needed was because if too much water accumulated on the rooftop of a Gothic church like this one over here, it could easily collapse that would be very bad news. So in order to let the water flow, they built these gargoyles, which would spout water from their mouths. And there we go, we have the gargoyle. When you actually see a gargoyle that's not gargling water, that is actually a grotesque. So the things that used to be on top of Notre Dame were grotesques. But Notre Dame actually has practical gargoyles too. This is the cage in Paris where they used to imprison unruly tourists. Okay, I'm just joking around. I have no idea why this cage is in front of the Church of St. Julian the Poor. This was built in the 13th century and replaced the church that was built in the 6th century. However, it is one of the oldest religious structures still standing in Paris. But one of the reasons I love it so much was because one of my favorite films before sunset actually is filmed here. So let's walk inside. Wow. This is the largest necropolis in the entire world, the Paris Catacombs, with more than 6 million people buried underneath the streets of Paris. In what used to be quarries originally for limestone, all these famous Parisian buildings such as Notre Dame use limestone that we see all around us right now. But then by the 1700s, these quarries were abandoned and they were starting to collapse, causing sinkholes that would swallow up entire Parisian homes and even killing Parisians. People started to panic, so they hired an engineer in order to tie all these tunnels together, build a massive network. And as all the different graveyards started overfilling and causing a, a terrible stench that would spoil milk to anyone who lived nearby and made wine go sour, they had to do something. They had to bury the people somewhere. So they decided to convert many of these former quarry tunnels into the catacombs of Nosuari. And here we see many thousands upon thousands of bones stacked up all these were people, Parisians, who lived an everyday life. Like this guy over here. I wonder what his life was about. That guy enjoyed coffee at least once. Or this guy over here. He enjoyed probably many cups of wine. And some of them have writings on it. This one says SSN. I wonder what that means. Now this is a huge, huge complex. Now there are many legends with the catacombs. Back in 2004, police who regularly work in the catacombs, as they were going deeper and deeper into the darkness of the catacombs, they heard dogs barking violently. 
and they were scared because they thought they were surrounded by rabid dogs from someone. Someone brought them down here. They end up going deeper and deeper, trying to calm the dogs down. And as they went down, they saw that there was just a tape recording. As they went inside and saw that tape recording, there were lights all around. There's 20 seats carved into the limestone, and there was a actual theater inside. They couldn't figure out how they got electricity down there. You know, this is an official site, but they didn't know how someone else got electricity down there. They had telephone lines, there was a bar fully stocked, there was everything. And then they saw a weird metal object with a lot of wires and they had to call in the bomb squad because they thought it was going to be a bomb. So they got the bomb squad down there and they found out it was just a couscous maker. Weeks later, they ended up finding out that everything was gone. The projector for the cinema was gone. All the alcohol of the bar was gone. All the electricity and the wiring was gone. All the telephone lines limped out. The couscous maker, probably missing. And it just had one note that said, in French, don't search. Why? Who knows? This is the steampunk station in the Paris metro system. It is the Arts and Metiers stop that was originally opened in 1904. However, originally it didn't look like this because in 1994 they redesigned it and hired an artist that worked for Belgian comics to design it in a Jules Verne steampunk-esque style. That artist was Francois Goitien, who ended up doing all these gears and little submarine windows in order to make you feel like you're 20,000 leagues under the sea. It's really cool. There's even miniatures here in these windows. And I love the wooden style bench seats as well. All the copper details. This is just the coolest station. It's actually right underneath one of the most prestigious engineering schools in all of France as well. A lot of people actually don't come here too often. It's one of the least visited stations in all of Paris. This Grand Opera House in Paris was built after an assassination attempt of the last emperor of France, Napoleon III, and also is the real life opera house of the Phantom of the Opera. This is the Ballet Garnier, which is located in the heart of Paris. But what happened? Well, in 1858, January, a Italian nationalist by the name of Felice Orsini threw three bombs to the carriage of Napoleon III. In the old opera house, he had to enter through the front. Napoleon III was vulnerable to attack at any moment. So Napoleon III demanded to build a new grand opera house in the new Paris that was built by George Eugene Hausmann. As we can see, this grand boulevard that extends all the way down with beautiful architecture. This opera house had to have a secret carriageway so he can enter into the opera house because the emperor loved opera. And that night he was going to see Rossini and was rudely interrupted. Charles Garnier, who was an unknown architect at that time, but very talented, built this up. George Eugene Hausmann, who built all of Paris, hated it because he thought this was a blight. He thought this was a mishmash of too many different styles. The wife of Emperor Napoleon III actually thought the same thing, but it won the hearts of people and they named the opera house after the architect, Garnier. However, this is the real life opera house of Phantom of the Opera that inspired directly the writer Gaston Leroux to write the book. But according to legend, one of the architects that worked with Charles Garnier wanted to live inside the opera house. His name was Eric. And apparently he lived down in the basement of the opera house during its construction. He ended up inspiring the main character of Phantom of the Opera, Eric. But is there a real underground lake? Well, where this was built, there was underground water coming in from the Seine River. And Charles Garnier realized that if he built any further, this was going to sink. So Charles Garnier came up with a genius idea. He built water reservoirs in order to hold the water so it won't sink the building. So there's technically no underground lake like the show by Android Lloyd Webber that's on Broadway. There is water and apparently there's fish underneath where the employees feed those fish. I'm not sure if that's true. However, the chandelier, they actually crashed down. Well, technically. The chandelier itself did not crash down. One night, unfortunately, a short circuit was melting down the cables that was holding the counterweight. And the counterweight collapsed and hit someone right in the audience on the head who was one of the attendants. She died directly on impact. This scared the people of Paris and inspired Gaston Leroux to write that famous scene of the phantom cutting down the chandelier. This is one of the best places you can visit in Paris. It's gorgeous, 
highly recommend it. Through this unsuspecting doorway is a secret garden here along the Grand Boulevards of Paris. Let's walk into the Hotel du Sully, which is very beautiful. It was built in 1630 in order for the high nobility of Paris that love to live in this neighborhood that is now known as La Marais. And oh my god, this is the cool thing about strolling in Paris is that you bump into wonders like these, just wandering around, just strolling. You see this at all times of day and night. Look at all the statuary that's over here. So let's go for, for a walk right through here. Oh, how I love Paris. <laughs> this statue is very fascinating. And behold, the garden here hidden, open to the public. You can come in, have your lunch, your little picnic, have a nice drink, a cup of wine, some baguette, maybe a croissant, and your day is set. The architecture here is just breathtaking and it's really hard to even find any other city that has such breathtaking architecture in huge swaths of this city. You know, I'm from New York and New York, while there's cool architecture, <laughs> something about Paris's uniformity in terms of the architecture that was built by George Eugen Hausmann and these older hotels and other types of structures that predate it. It's just magical. So let's see what this other doorway leads. by the mansion of Victor Hugo and these nobles had direct access to a beautiful park right over here so let's finish right over here before three minutes go because that's the limit for these videos <laughs> it's plain oh my god this is so heavenly wow behold the Palace of Osage. This is the oldest tree in all of Paris, planted by a man named John Robin in 1601, who imported a locust tree from North America and planted it right here. It is also known as a Robinier, and it's right in front of the Cathedral of Notre Dame here at Viviani Square. Now, this might have provided shade for the Sun King himself, Louis XIV, or other famous Parisians, such as Victor Hugo, who wrote The Hunchback of Notre Dame, or Ernest Hemingway himself. Here we can see that it is named Robinier, named after the guy who planted it and is encircled by benches in order to protect it. Now, this grows usually about 30 feet, but this one grew to more than 50 feet, so it's gigantic. It's even supported by some concrete over here. Just imagine all the history this tree has seen. This is the love wall in Paris with more than 250 ways of saying I love you in different languages. Made in the year 2000 by Frederick Baron and Claire Quito. It has all these beautiful calligraphy, but there is a few languages that I know, such as Spanish, with my friend here, Diana. Hi. And where's the Spanish ones? Te amo, it's over there. Ooh, te amo, okay. Te quiero, it's over there. Let's see, the te quiero, point it out. So that's two, two ways of saying I love you in yes. Spanish. And then there's the Catalan. There's the Catalan right here. Which is the other language Destimo. in Spain. Destimo. Yes. Oh, I love that. And then do you have any other favorite ones? Uh, well, the French one, of course, because we're in France. It's right there. The classic. Je t'aime. Je t'aime. This is one of the narrowest houses in all of Paris. Only one meter wide, 10 meters tall, is super skinny. It is 22 Rue Saint Severin. And apparently the famous French novelist Abbe Provost lived here for a while. Now, I cannot imagine living here. Let me know, will you live in this tiny little house? Only two windows per floor. Must be really, really tight. Would you live here? This is the monastery built on an island in the middle of one of the places with the biggest tidal changes in the world. Here in northern France, 
It is Mount Saint-Michel. It is located in Normandy and it has a very interesting figure on the very top, the Archangel Michael. This is one of the main reasons why it was built in the first place. For this, we have to go back to 700 AD. Back in that time, Bishop Hubert had a vision from the Archangel Michael one night and decided to ignore it because he thought it was just a random dream. Then the Archangel Michael was very persistent. So he came a second time saying, hey, you have to build this huge monastery on this island in the mouth of the river that goes between Normandy and Brittany. And the second time Bishop Hubert was like, eh, this might be a demon. So maybe I should not listen to it because dreams are the realm for demons. So he ignored him second time. Then Archangel Michael got really, really persistent. He came to him a third time, but this time he touched his finger right in his skull and burned a hole right in front of his skull. That was the for sure message that Bishop Hubert had to build this huge monastery. And thus he did. He built this gigantic monastery that throughout the ages was fortified more and more and more all around here, never conquered by the English, even though the English and the French were at war for many hundreds of years. And now it is a massive tourist attraction with more than 3 million people, but it's also covered all around with quicksand. It is advisable to not walk here without a guide, at least not too far, because this gets submerged in water every single day. Day. Today the tide is very very low and sometimes the tide is very very high even submerging this bridge that we're standing on. But if you step on the wrong place you might get swallowed up by the sand, crushed by it, the lungs will collapse and you could die. So watch out when walking here to beautiful Mont Saint-Michel. So right here are the directions of how to save yourself from quicksand. So read them before you go on walking. This is a gorgeous place to visit. Highly recommend it. Stay curious, my friends.